Second Chronicles chapter 26. Second Chronicles chapter 26. Then we'll read verse 17. Second Chronicles chapter 26. And we'll read verse 17. The passage talks about Uzziah the king, and he wanted to give a sacrifice to the Lord, which sounds like a good thing, but he actually violated the Old Testament law because he was not supposed to burn incense. It was actually the priest. But he did not care, and he did it his own way because to him, he thought it was the right thing in his eyes. So to him, it looked right. But in the end, what the Lord did was he struck him down with an incurable infection. What I find interesting is that when Uzziah was angry, he was not thinking, he did not care, and he did it his own way, and that's when the Lord struck him down with leprosy, and he was not cured since. Look at verse 17. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from besides the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house being a leopard for he was cut off from the house of the Lord and Joseph uh, Jotham his son was over the king's house judging the people of the land now the rest of the acts of Uzziah first and last did Isaiah the prophet the son of Amos write so Uzziah slept with his fathers and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belonged to the kings. For they said, He is a leper. And Jotham his son reigned in his stead. It's a tragic story where Uzziah the king, he lost control of himself and he lost his temper. So he wasn't thinking about the consequences, did not think about the dire tragedy of his sin. And because of that, it was at that time the Lord struck him down with leprosy. Uzziah, he became a leper till the day he died. The scriptures never recorded that he was ever cured or that God ever used him again after that. His anger lost control. He lost boundaries and then he died being a leper. And it is so sad that at verse 23, they known him as a leper. The Bible says he is a leper. A lot of times, one of the most uncontrollable things is anger. Anger is a sin. We have to understand that being angry is a sin. If you said you were never angry before, I think you're a liar. So you sin twice. You're angry and you're a liar, you know. So we've all lost control before. We all lost control before. Even myself, when there were times that, you know, I was very nice, kept to myself. But that was the worst moments is that when I try to hold it all in and then trying to be nice. And then when that angry time come, you thought I was a psycho. <laughs> So I just came cut loose. So that does happen. Everybody loses their cool sometime in their life before. And you have to understand that anger is a sin. Anger, you have to understand, is the cause of family divisions, children turning against parents, uh, spouses getting divorced, church having splits, and even Bible-believing preachers never uniting with each other. Anger is a sin. You see the detriment in our world. You know why the people, uh, our country is going down? There is one emotion everybody feels, anger. Anger. Everyone is angry, whether you're in the good side or the bad side. Everyone is angry. So everyone experiences such emotions. And anger has to be controlled and managed. But are you one of those people that I just don't know how to control it? Or some of you don't realize that you are an angry person and don't ser uh, seriously consider 
the consequences of it. I hope that today's message will be eye-opening, that you'll realize that anger is a disease. It is an infection that is pretty much incurable if you don't do anything about it. I don't know if any of you are stricken down and sick with anger. So I would like to use the comparison in the Bible about Uzziah's illness, his infection, that started because when he lost his cool. You know what that? That's when he was stricken with his disease, when he lost his cool. And I want you to understand it's like an incurable leprosy, and it will infect you for the rest of your life unless something is done. The title of my message today is Angry Infection. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you'll fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Cleanse away my sins with your blood. Uh, this is one of those sins, Heavenly Father, that needs to be preached against. It's because of the sin that the church cannot unite, that families are divided, and that you cannot use a person like me. And so I pray that all of us today, that both minister and members will be able to conquer this sin. They'll be seeped down and covered under the blood of Jesus Christ so that we can purely love each other, unfeigned love as the Bible worded it, and we'll be able to expand even more for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, now anger, I understand in the Bible that it can be used for good. The emotion of anger is not a sin itself. Sometimes I'll just generally say that, but Jesus Christ was angry before. We know that in the Bible. Uh, there are several cases in the Bible of famous biblical characters who got angry. Why? Because of sin. So because of sin, that's why there is anger. And so there is a thing called righteous indignation. But one thing that is so dangerous about righteous indignation, believe it or not, is this happened to me. So I know that this can happen to you. Is that a lot of times when I lose my cool, I feel like I have righteous indignation. Why? Because when you get angry, you just don't get angry. You get angry for a good reason. Can I repeat that again? You get angry. Because you have a legitimate reason to get angry. That's why we all lose our cool. We don't just lose our cool all of a sudden sporadically, you know. What, what happens? Because there's something in our minds that causes us to get angry. There's something that we feel hurt by and then we just lose our cool. So that's a dangerous thing. And you need to fix that. The first point is the infection is immediate. The infection is immediate. Look at verse 19. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord. Now, look at that verse again. When he was wroth, when the verse says, while he was wroth. Did you see that? While he was wroth with the priests, the what? Leprosy rose up all the way to his forehead. Do you understand? Once he lost his cool, the infection, the leprosy already rose up up to his forehead. I find that very revealing that the case happens in anger that the infection just spreads quickly. It's so fast you can't catch it. You know what I'm talking about? You thought that you had everything under control, that you had a cool head, that you had every reasonable thing that you can manage, but then it just comes up so quickly, you fail to catch it. That's what anger does. It said it happened right on the spot. Not later, but immediately on the spot. Is that you? The Bible says a great verse to memorize for angry people. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. He that is slow slow to wrath, is of great understanding. But he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. The infection of anger is immediate, so understanding, the Bible says, is the key to prevent that immediate reaction. The verse says, if you're slow to wrath, you're of what? Great, great understanding. I can't tell you how many times that rescued me so many times in my life. It's so important that in order to prevent anger, you have to have an understanding of the other person. I can't tell you how many times 
in my own life, when I reflect myself with my family, with my parents, with my own spouse, when I see it from other people in the church, the important thing to resolve and then to keep that intermediate cool in between is, is there understanding anywhere in there? No, it's always me. It's always how I feel, what I'm upset about, what my legitimate reasons are, what my pains are. And that is extremely dangerous. That's the reason why anger immediately pops out. Because it's all about yourself that you're thinking about. But you can't have an understanding of yourself. The, the switcheroo is an understanding of others. And automatically, it does a click. It slows down the anger. It slows down your temper because you're thinking about the other person. Because what helped me many times, which made me a pastor today, being a pastor, you have to have an understanding of people. If you don't have that, then you should get off the pulpit. You cannot be a pastor. It doesn't matter if uh, a pastor has righteous indignation, criticizes preachers. You know me, I go, I slam on all fours and I don't apologize for that. But that don't mean that I don't have understanding of people. Preachers, you can uh, point your bony finger, preach hellfire, brimstone, not compromise and criticize uh, wrong doctrines and etc. and sinners. But if you have no understanding of people, you should get out of the pulpit. Because Jesus, even though he whipped people out of a marketplace, he had an understanding to cry over the city. Yeah. You know, the thing is, you have to have compassion. It's so important. What helps me to have compassion on other people, which is why I became a pastor, why would I want to pastor here? There's better places to pastor, much easier places to pastor. Why here of all places, especially when restrictions, there's so many rules, regulations, you wouldn't believe what you have to go through to start a church over here. It's practically impossible to get your own building here, you have to understand. And then the people are hard to work with as well because it's such a liberal, unbelieving, godless, sinful world. So it's hard to encourage them into church. But why would I pastor here? It's because of compassion to begin with. You have to understand why I became a pastor was a burden, a compassion for people. People who are broken, bound by sin, deceived. They don't know what's right and wrong. When they're living out in sin, they don't know what they're doing is wrong. It's so sad and tragic, and that's the reason why I started pastoring here. That's the reason why I kicked false preachers out there, because these are the people who should have guided the flock and the sheep better, but they failed to do their job. That's why I kick pastors more than I do with any other person. Yeah, my own group, pastors, I kick them harder than any other groups of people. Because a pastor's position is to have care and compassion for people why would I think about that with people's broken states? It's easy. All I have to think about is, Gene, look at you right now. You got Bible-believing truth. You got everything. You got knowledge. What if I switched your life with that poor, lost, broken soul in the Bay Area who's holding out a sign, screaming protest, cussing, and taking my name in vain, and an atheist unbeliever, and is bound for hell for eternity? What if I switched your life with that person? You know, don't you realize that as of this very moment right now while I'm preaching at you, there's a lost soul out there who hates God, who is bitter at Christianity, and is living out in sin. What if my life switched with that person? It broke my heart. And then I realized, man, Lord, I am so blessed to be where I'm at. And that's what helps me with my anger against others is what if God switched your life with their life. I mean, you might feel like you have a legitimate reason to get angry at that person, but if you, look, if you went inside that person's life and you were there at their birth, you went through the tragedies they went through, their history, the deception that they learned, they don't have knowledge that you got. They don't have the answers you've got. And when you think about that, then it helps you to not get angry at that person. You know what I do? If I get angry at somebody, I have to think about this. Look, you went to PBI. You knew all the, about the Bible. You know the ministries and the trials. That other person doesn't. So you have to understand what that person is thinking and feeling. Because what if God puts you in that person's shoe? I know what the answer is to that one. If God put me in that person's shoe, I'd do far worse than that person. I'd do far worse. 
It's, uh, that's why you get angry. You think you're better than the other person. But if you had their emotions that they're feeling right now, if you had their body, their mindset they went through, their history, their lifestyle and everything, you probably do much worse than they do. It's so important to understand that. And that helps me to be slow to anger. Do you think about that way with people? No, you think about your pain, your issue. You don't think about the other person. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 33 says, Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. You know, the Bible says right here that wrath, uh, how fights come out is when you force out wrath. So there are these factors right there, th those buttons that you push that explode and start wrath, strife. That's what the passage is pointing out right here. There are certain factors there that can exp uh, cause the division and the fight. So it's so important that in order to avoid the anger becoming so immediate is that you have to find the causes of it. You know, that's so hard. I had knowledge about, okay, these are the areas that you're going to get angry with, Gene. So because of that, watch out for this, watch out for that. Make sure that you shut your mouth when, you do, when, it, when the emotion comes out at that point. I had a tactic and plan ready, and guess what? Anger still comes out. Why? Because it's so immediate you can't catch it. That's why it's so important if you don't even have a battle plan, if you don't even consider about the factors that push your button, then I guarantee you this, you won't be self-controlled. You have to have a plan. You have to know the factors. What are your weak areas that make you angry? You have to think about. What are those buttons that push that causes you to explode and go, ah, you don't want to know mine, all right? And I don't want to know yours, please. No, 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 don't tell me, don't tell me. So we all have our buttons that you push. And it's so important that uh, when those buttons happen, I have to know what they are. Do you ever stop and think about that? No, you just don't think about it. And if the emotions want to come out, you just let it come out. And that's a dangerous thing. No, you have to know what are the causes to your anger. And when I think about it, it helps me mentally prepare. Okay, you know what's going to happen. You're going to get angry when the person says this kind of stuff. So get ready. Just shut your mouth. No matter what the person says, just close that lip, you know, just take a deep breath. And then when I hear that person talk, I am mentally prepared. And I've prayed up and asked the Lord for help. And when I hear the person say something out of his or her mouth, then I'm mentally prepared. And then I go, and then I pray to the Lord and surrender it to him. But if I didn't have that, imagine that the person said something that I wasn't expecting. What's the immediate reaction? Well, anger is immediate. Then what do I do? Then then who's the louder one wins, you know? You got to prepare beforehand. You know what? If I were you, don't just come on the altar and repent of your anger. No, when you come to the altar, say, Lord, this is my weakness of my anger. Lord, I don't know what they are. Will you show it to me? And then when you know what they are, have a list of those and say, okay, God, this is it, this is it, this is it. This is what I'm going to do next time when it happens. This is my weak areas, and this is what I'm going to do. Then you'll prevent the anger from coming out immediately. It's so important to do that. Uh, a couple things that helped me was that I would tell myself that, uh, you know, before you burst open, okay, you can say whatever you want, get angry, whatever you want, but at least just stop and think for 10 seconds. When I do that, it's helped me a lot, you know. I feel like, I want to blow up. And then I'm like, okay, you can blow up, but just wait 10 seconds and think for a moment, you know. Those 10 seconds really make a huge difference. And I go, yeah, I don't want that. Because when I say this, when I explode, this is what's going to happen. I really don't want that. And then, shh. You got to stop at least for a moment. And you got to think about the consequences that happen you got to have great understanding of the person. Second point, the infection is irreversible. The infection is irreversible. Look at verse 20. Look at verse 20. 
And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests look upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord hath smitten him. Did you see that? This is important to know. Verse 20, you'll notice Uzziah hasted to go out. Now think about it, Uzziah, he was, what was his sin? Why did the Lord strike him down with leprosy? Because he was offering incense when that's not his job. The priest is supposed to offer incense in the Old Testament, not kings. So Uzziah was angry. You know, the priest said, you know, I sh uh, you, know you shouldn't be giving an offering to the Lord. It's the priest's job. And Uzziah got angry, blah, blah, blah. And then immediately leprosy hit. When the leprosy hit, Uzziah freaked out and he got scared. And you know what happened? He did not stay on the altar, guys. He wasn't holding the incense. You know what he did? He immediately ran out of the temple. Why? It's as if he wants that leprosy to go away if he stopped doing the incense. If he stopped doing the priest work. It's as if it'll revert back if I just get out of here. Oh, I know better. Uh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, because I touched that thing, that's why I got leprosy. Okay, drop it. Run. Get out of there. But guess what? Even though he tried to revert back the disease, it would not revert. You know what my point is? When anger comes out, it's irreversible. You can't take it back. Once the person saw your scary eyes and then your no nostrils, your two little dark nostrils coming out like this, and then that, that, te that bunny teeth coming out like that, and then, you know, that, ah, like that dragon fire out of your mouth, guess what? That's in their image. They're not going to forget that. <laughs> you think they're going to automatically forget that and you can take all that back? No. Once anger comes out, it's irreversible. They remember the words that you said. They remember the tone of volume that you yelled down on them. They heard about your anger and your expression that deeply hurt them. And hurt in somebody's emotion cannot be reversed just like that. The infection is irreversible. Uzziah's infection was not reverted. The leprosy clung on to him when he ran away from the temple. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 14, the beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore leave off contention before it be meddled with. You know, once you turn on the knob in the faucet and the water comes out, it's not as if, oh, turn it off, that the water's just going to go like that. No, it falls down to the ground. It cannot be reverted. Once water comes out, it comes out, guys. And that's what the Bible likens anger, is that once you turn it on, that faucet knob and the anger flows out, it cannot just go back inside. It will come out and it spills all over the ground. You made a mess. It can't be reverted back. Damage gets already done. Here are some things that cannot be reversed when you get angry. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 17, he that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. You know, usually thinking people, they get away from anger because they think before they do something foolish. People who tend to think about consequences, the tragedy, and the weight of words, they get away from angry situations and damages because they think before they do something foolish. A foolish person is one who gets angry very quickly. That's the point, is when you're angry, you're not thinking. You're feeling. You're feeling. There are thoughts that flood your mind, but it's guided by emotions. Because the emotion of hurt comes in, and that hurtful emo emotion brings up the image in your mind, or the thought in your mind. That's very dangerous, and you have to understand that You've got to think before you do something. If you don't think before you do something, that's why the damage is done. Think, think about all these irreversible scenarios. You become foolish. You said a lot of dumb, stupid stuff before when you got angry. Don't tell me you didn't. Yeah, you did. When you get angry, you say dumb, stupid stuff. You don't say rational, uh, sensible stuff. You might think you do, but later on when you find out, when you see a video recording of how you delivered it, it's not what you imagined. And when you look at a video recording of yourself, you go, 
man, I look like an idiot. I did look like a fool, and yeah, and you can't take that back. You look like a fool. You look like an idiot. The Bible says in Proverbs twenty two twenty four, make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. You know, that's another irreversible scenario is that when you have fellowship with the person that got angry with you, the next time you meet with that person, it's not like, hey, you know, it's that tension. Because the Bible says make no friend, uh, friendship with an angry man. You know what's really sad? It did happen in this church and it did happen in other churches. I remember Pastor Andrus gave a situation. Guy who loved the Lord, was sincere, wanted to serve God, but he had anger issues. And then no matter how much grace they showed and put up with the guy, and then the guy was sincere, and he probably repented too and tried to get right, but it was just such, so bad that when the person walked inside the church that, you know, there's this fear and you don't, this tension. So finally, Pastor Andrews had to tell him, hey, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, I can't have you in our church anymore. That's sad. It happened to our church before too in other churches. Why? Because there's that tension in fellowship. And when you look at that person and talk to that person that, oh man, is that person going to get angry at me? Kids are watching, and when they see that, it's irreversible. You lose fellowship. You know that's that? You lose fellowship with people who originally loved you, said hi to you, praying for you, you know, we'll be, we'll be supportive of you. Those people you're no longer fellowshipping with. Isn't that sad? That's sad. It was hard for me as a pastor when I had to let some people go, and I said, it's best that you don't come back. It was hard for me. But you know why? They had anger issues. You can't reverse it back. You can't revert that. Anger, do you realize the serious consequence of this sin? It's a horrible sin that, in fact, even lost people know it's a horrible thing. It causes tragedy, anger causes a tension in the fellowship and eventually separation if you're not careful. Why do you think divorce happens? Because they were so happy with each other. No, it all started with, I'm angry with something that you did wrong. And then that's why no longer in unity, it's separated. You can't revert that. Proverbs 12, 16 says, A fool's wrath is presently known but a prudent man covereth shame. You know, another thing you can't revert back when you get angry is shame. Embarrassment. You know that? Shame and embarrassment is one of the tragic consequences. Of course, I committed that before. There were some shameful things that I did that I can't revert. And uh, I would dare say that 100%, if not 99% of you, had that happen to you before. All right? That there was shame, embarrassment. Why? Because... When that person you got so angry with, okay, I know this, is that, because me, I'm a very thinking type of person, but even with my mind who's so thinking, I lose, I can't help but lose my cool and think that I have a good reason. Okay, listen, I have a good reason to get angry. And so then when I let it out and blurt it out, you know what the hardest feeling is after that? Then later on I find out that I was wrong. And I was smarter than the other person. I was more sensible than the other person when I argued and I got angry. So I must be right. And then later on I found out, oh, you know how embarrassed I was after that? Then the other person loses trust in me. People saw me and I ruined my testimony. Anger is such a horrible thing, guys. It's a shameful thing. You cannot revert embarrassment and regret. You can't revert that. That lingering feeling, embarrassment and regret, will haunt you for the rest of your life. That's why anger is such a terrible infection that's irreversible. You don't want to embarrass yourself. You don't want to regret. And guess what? The person that you are angry with, they will trust me. Years later, they remember it and they will bring it up to you. I promise you that. And then how do you revert that one? The mess that you made. It's a shame and an embarrassment that you'll never erase. 
you know, uh, even I, un, I know this too, is that even children who are insti- like teenagers who are so rebellious and they can be in the wrong and the parents can be in the right. And these teenagers are just so wicked and evil and prodigal sons. You know what? They don't forget the slip ups the parents made and they will bring it up to you. They do. That's a sad thing. Why? Because uh, I'm, a person, uh, I'm a person too. I have parents too. And I would remember them, uh, those things my parents did, and bring it up. And you were all once children too, and you brought it up to your parents before. It never leaves. The, imbe- the shame never leaves. It's irreversible. Proverbs 19.19, 19, a man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. For if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. Oh, that's the hard part. The Bible says that if you're dealing with an angry person, you know what the tough thing about angry people is? Is that when they make a mess, you have to clean up their mess. You have to repair the mess. And then you have to get them back up again. And then when they get angry and then, you know, throw their toys all over the room again, and then you have to go, oh, you clean up their toys, you know, you clean up their stains and then calm them down again. And then the next time they throw their toys again and you clean it up again. It's a hassle. It's a burst burden. You know what it is? A person with anger issues brings grief to people around him or her. That's what anger does. Man, if this is a horrible passage. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. If thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. What a burden. What a bur- that brings so much grief. Aren't you proud of yourself for hurting the heart of your loved ones and bringing them stress with gray hairs? Aren't you proud of yourself? And by the way, don't think about other people. Think about yourself. That's the key of anger. Anger is I'm thinking about the other person, not me. And when you think about yourself, then you realize that, wow, wow. I'm the one, whenever we have a family get-together, it's, there's tension. I'm the one, when we have a church get-together, there is tension. I'm the only one, when I'm in my workplace, that there is tension. And I'm the one, yeah, you're the one. You brought grief to the people. Don't you want to be the person that people will say, I'm so happy you're here. I'm so glad you're a part of my life. I really love you. You helped me so much in my life. Don't you want to be that person instead? Proverbs chapter 27, verse 3 says, A stone is heavy and the sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. I know the feeling inside. There's so much anger that you just have to vent it out, right? Why? Because it, it just, uh, it, you can't control it. It's a horrible feeling inside. So you just have to let it out. Ah! Let the demon out of you, right? Get the demon out of you and you go, ah! Why? Because it just feels better when you do that because it feels horrible when you're, it's all locked up inside and then you just want to let it out. But you got to ask yourself, what good is that? Anger is just words that hit the air It profits nothing, it hurts other people, makes you look like an idiot to the public eye, it brings embarrassment, made you commit a deliberate sin against God, and caused you to lose your reward in heaven. Boy, that sure feels better, doesn't it, to vent it all out? It's a worse feeling. It's a worse feeling. I thought venting out the anger would make me feel better. No, it just made it worse. It left you an empty feeling and a deeper hurt feeling and a horrible feeling. My third point is the infection is incurable. The infection is incurable. Look at verse 21. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Man, that's sad. Do you see that right there? He is king. He's still king, but he can't really rule as king. Be technically there. He was cast aside, separated from his own people, and he was a leper till the day he died. He was never cured, guys. Church, he was never cured. 
the infection is incurable. I don't know if you ever realized a point in your life that when you got angry and then you try to control it, it just came out for no good apparent reason. You're like, wow, this is horrible. It's like something came over me and I didn't realize that. You know, I thought that I was a cool, uh, that I controlled myself pretty good. But then later on when I realized, uh, especially after I got married of all things, it's a weird thing. You know, I thought that, you know, that, okay, I'm prepared for marriage, you know, and I'll do this and that. She's such a sweet girl and you'll just do very well, you know. And me, I'm a godly person too, you know, and so I can do this. And then it's so amazing that after marriage, I'm like, what in the world is going on? I was like, no, no, don't thank the Lord. What are you talking about, brother? <laughs> so then I just tear my hair and I go, what's going on? I was like, this is not what I expected. But <laughs> then you know what happened after that? What I realized, the truth? I had anger issues. It was like an uh, eye-opening thing. I was like, I thought I was patient and loving as a pastor, you know? You know, why are you, why are you laughing, sister? <laughs> I was patient and loving as a pastor, you know, and, you know, but wow, I'm a horrible person. <laughs> it was very, very eye-opening. Now, y'all don't judge me, all right? I, y'all don't judge me. Wait till I hear about your lives, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> so then the thing is, is that that's been an eye op- The eye-opening thing is this. This is very important to understand. Uh, I say all this humor, but it's a, ver- it's a deep truth is that you think that you're in control. You think that uh, you're prepared and that, you know, you have legitimate reasons. But once that anger comes up, you realize it is a disease that cannot be cured. It's like something that comes out of you and you didn't realize it. So then I was like, wow, this is a, you got to realize this infection is a terrible disease. You have to realize that. It's like an incurable infection. Once you realize that it's incurable, you're going to try means to immediately cure it before it gets to that point. All right, that sounds a little contradictory, but there's a point to this. The point is, is that this anger is incurable, okay, guys? If you realize that, you're going to take steps beforehand. Okay, I need to get rid of this thing as soon as possible. There's got to be something that can relieve this or cure this before I get to that incurable phase. Anger is incurable, guys. Before you jump in there, you got to take steps to cure that. It's worse than cancer, guys. It's worse than leprosy. And there is a doctor. Luke 7, verse 21. In that same hour, Jesus cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And to many that were blind, he gave sight. Jesus can cure you of anything, yes, and even anger. He can cure you, my friend. But the more that you yield to anger, the infection feels like it's incurable. It cannot be cured. The division, the fight, the separation, the tension will never be cured. You're going to reach that point in your life. You're going to feel like that you lost the other person, that you lost yourself because of that incurable, horrible sin. It's a hor- I hope you're angry with me against anger, if that makes any sense. That you got to get angry at this wicked sin and say, I want to conquer this thing. Before it gets any worse, you need to cure it. And the first step is you need to realize you do have an anger problem. That's the most important thing. You know, in Ephesians 4, verse 26, it's a famous passage about be angry and sin not. The next part, what does it say? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. If that anger lingers throughout the day, you should tell yourself, I do have an anger issue. I do have an anger issue. It's not like, oh, it's just that one time and there was a good reason. No, no, no. If that, there's that feeling that lingers there, you have to realize, okay, I do have anger issues. I had to tell myself that. I had to tell myself that, that I did have anger issues. Some of you don't realize that you do have, uh, that you have an anger problem. 
That's why you were never cured to begin with. Do you realize that? You were never cured to begin with because you never realized you had the disease. Do you uh, think about those moments? Did you ever have that anger that just lasted for a while? An anger that turned to bitterness? That you thought you swept it under your unconscious mind, but then years later, you brought it up again? That's a horrible, horrible thing. You need to realize you have it. Another thing, once you realize it, you need to, the natural reaction in getting angry is because you think you're right. All right? That is so important to understand. You think you're right. That's why anger comes out. All right? Yeah, it is true. It is true. Because I'm always right when I fight with my wife, guys. I'm always right. That feeling never changed since. It's that feeling, right? I'm right, okay? It doesn't matter how right you think you are. So it's important that you have to switch that thinking is, okay, what am I wrong? All right? You know why? Because it's, you, that will never leave you. I'm right when you get angry. That, that will never leave you. Believe me, it will never leave you. So you need to force yourself to think, okay, let's think what I'm wrong about. No, it's plain as day. You know what she's wrong about? No, no. What am I wrong? It's so plain that she said that. Stop. What am I wrong? All right? I don't care if she was waving a butcher knife at me, you know, just think about what did I do wrong, you know? All right? So I had to do that. I had to tell myself because you will, trust me, you will know and you will believe and you will feel you're right when you're angry. That will never leave you guys. Believe me that. So it's so important you have to force yourself. What am I wrong? And then after that, what happens after that? You think about, okay, what is that person right on? Outside of that demon outside, ah, screaming at you, look behind that. That person has a heart. It's called a heart, and it beats. And think about, what did that person do right? Was it, because that person just don't come out like that for no good reason. That person is thinking about, what am I right about? And that's why that person got angry at you. And you need to recognize, what is that person thinking about he or she is right on? And that's the most difficult part is to be considerate of others rather than the self. Anger is all about self. It is all about pride. It is all about sin. It is all about me, me, me. It is all about selfishness. The bottom line, it's, it's self. That's the problem. You have to be considerate of, of, the, of the other person's feelings you're angry with. You've got to try to find their right points. And you got to do somewhere that there's got to be some, something there that there's a middle ground. You have to th be considerate of that person's feeling. Sometimes a person may not take it as hard as you would, actually, or you, uh, they might take it harder than you. Why? Because their history, their life, their past, uh, they went through some deeper struggles. And I had to realize that, uh, that I was not dealing with Gene Kim when I'm arguing. I'm dealing with... A frail woman, my wife, that helped me a lot to realize there are some things I can take. You know, as a Bible believer, I came from PBI, and then there were cockroaches this big that flew around, you know, and I would stomp on, stomp on them with my sandal, you know, and then won't blink an eye. So I'm just so used to that, but then my wife can't take that much, all right? If she saw a flying cockroach, she'd probably die of a heart attack and collapse, all right? And then me, I'd go, oh, come on, why are you not a Christian soldier? You're just so embarrassing, you know? You got to realize people are different from you. So you have to think, you can't think about your emotions. You have to think about the other person's emotions. That's very important. You have to think about the other person's emotions and realize that um, it was eye-opening when we went to see Pastor Hilton Smith with the sheep. I was like... They're fragile. Look at Sheila. She's trying to be a mom, you know, and then going, here, here. And then that sheep's like. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? I was like, I don't want to take care of those sheep. And then I realized that's a pastor's job. A pastor is a shepherd taking care of sheep. And I was like, 
And then I joked with Sister Sheila, yeah, now you know how I feel. It took me 10 years, Sister, <laughs> to finally have a church and gain my trust. <laughs> but the thing is, is that it was eye-opening to me with that sheep that th that's how they feel, that's how they are. So you have to think about that. You have to think about the other person's emotions who are uh, different from yours. They're not the same as your emotions. And thank God. God, all right? Thank God that you're not their emotions and then they're not your emotions, all right? We're all differently. I'm my own man and then you are your own you. You have to understand that. One thing that, uh, oh, that always worked is that when you try everything, you know, you try all these things and it still fails. Listen up, it still fails. And then you know what always works is prayer and you let it go to the Lord, all right? That's the hardest thing, but let it go to the Lord and pray, all right? You may not have ended that fight the way that you want to end it, but just pray, surrender it to the Lord. And then later on, you'll find out a week later, two weeks later, I don't know how many, how, how much time has passed, but that God fixes it and reconciles it. If you prayed about it, though, you have to pray about it. If you don't pray about it, then that will linger throughout the rest of your life. Think about your, uh, I don't know if there's somebody in your life, there's got to be some people in your life. I mean, if you live past uh, 25 years, there's got to be some people in your life that there were uh, divisions in life. Maybe it's time that you reconciled. You gave them a phone call and say, you know, I want to uh, fix some of the things in the life. You have to Pray to the Lord. You have to pray to the Lord and let him solve the problem. And he will. It always does. There was a time, I mean, I, I know how that feels like. I mean, I was at a point where I tried everything and I was tired. I was like, God, I can't talk anymore. I can't think anymore. Uh, I just pray, all right? And then w when I prayed, you know, and then I, w I felt the pain inside my chest too. I don't know if you ever felt that, but I felt so much pain in my chest and I was grabbing it. And just praying, I was like, God, I can't do this. And it was at the worst times you can think of, very important moments in our church where I had to have strength for the next day. It just so happened at that time. See? You don't know a lot of the private pains or the personal burdens that preachers go through, guys. But they do go through that. They go, they're like you. They're like you. They're human like you. And there were, so many, and there were moments in my life that I had to do that. But let me tell you, every time that I prayed to the Lord, he never failed to fix it. He never failed to fix it. He never did. That's why I'm still married. Okay. But <laughs> thinking, thinking, only about, thinking only about people's good points than the bad will tend to make you resolve the angry dispute. That's good. That's a good one. It's so important to do that. All right? Outside of that devil that you're looking at, she's a sweet, wonderful woman deep down inside who cooks really good food and who's very supportive. You got to... Think about the good point. When you look at the good point, you see the person that you intended to fellowship and love to begin with. You got to look at the good points that those people did. There was a person named Edward T. Bedford. He was sum summoned by Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, into his office. Now, I don't like Rockefeller, but there's a, tr a good point in this story. Bedford costed the Standard Oil Company $2 million dollars. Everyone knew Rockefeller was like extremely angry at him. You cost me $2 million. And back in those days, that's a lot of money. Bedford was brought before his office. But uh, Rockefeller surprisingly dealt calmly with him. And Bedford was shocked and surprised. The reason why was this. Rockefeller was writing all the good points that Bedford did. He wrote it on a piece of paper, looked at it, and when Bedford came inside his office, he looked at that piece of paper. When Bedford came in, Rockefeller dealt calmly with him. And Bedford stated, I never forgot that lesson. In later years, whenever I was tempted to rip into anyone, I forced myself first to sit down and thoughtfully compile as long a list of good points as I possibly could. Invariably, by the time I finished my inventory, I would see the matter in its true perspective and keep my temper under control. 
There's no telling how many times this habit has prevented me from committing one of the costliest mistakes any executive can make, losing his temper. I commend it to anyone who must deal with people. My last point is the infection is imperishable. The infection is imperishable. In verse 23, Uzziah died. But give him a break, guys. He was living his life a leper. You don't have to call him a leper after he's dead. The verse says he is a leper. Well, in the world, leave him alone, man. But that's what anger does is that it's imperishable. It'll haunt you in the afterlife. It just doesn't end when you die. Don't you realize that in your funeral, people, they have to say good things about you, right? And they will. But people won't forget also the anger that you had and lash out against them that deeply hurt them. And there are those people, I mean, the only time that they would probably come if they never get along with you is your funeral. And they ha that's the time they have to think about your good points, say about your good points. But guess what? In their feeling, they'll never forget. They'll never forget that pain, that angry situation you went through. That's a horrible thing, the sin of anger. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12 says, Hatred stirreth up stripes, but love covereth all sins. The, the best key where it will never haunt you in the afterlife is love. Pure, undying love. And Jesus only gave two commandments that pretty much solved everything. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love each other. And that's the cure is that if you truly love that person, it's hard for you to get angry, all right? You know, when my wife does something wrong, it's hard for me to get angry at her when she gives a cute reaction in her face or something like that. You know, then the anger just goes away and I kind of chuckle, you know? I kind of slightly rebuke her, but, you know, I chuckle. But you know why? It's because that love came out. The love, listen up, guys, love drowns out the anger. That's what helps. That's why there is no church split if there is true love amongst each other. Do you understand that? There's true love. If there's true love, there would be no church split, no church issues. You have to have genuine... Do you really love that person? Do you really love him or her? And if you don't, it's about time you recall and remember the good points the person did. You got to recall what if you were that person's shoe. And if you were in that person's shoe, wouldn't you have extra compassion and feel sorry for the person instead rather than anger, like Jesus did when he felt sorry for them rather than anger when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He felt more sorry for them than anger. I don't think anyone crucified you butt naked on a cross yet. You know, Bruce Goodrich, he was forced to run until he dropped, and he actually died, which was very sad. This happened at Texas A&M University. Short while later, Bruce's father wrote a letter. You, would, you can imagine, he's probably so angry at this university. So what did he write when he lost his son, who, was, who died, who dropped dead, because he was forced to run until he dropped? He wrote... I would like to take this opportunity to express the appreciation of my family for the great outpouring of concern and sympathy from Texas A&M University and the college community over the loss of our son, Bruce. We were particularly pleased to note that his Christian witness did not go unnoticed during his brief time on campus. I hope it will be some comfort to know that we harbor no ill will in the matter. Why? He wrote, we know our God makes no mistakes. Bruce had an appointment with his Lord and is now secure in his celestial home. When the question is asked, why did this happen? Perhaps one answer will be so that many will consider where they will spend eternity. He was able to witness to a college, a secular college, and give them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ what made me realize when I would start to have regrets about, is this the church that I'm pastoring? Is this the family that I want? Is these the people that I want to hang out? And 
I have all this in my mind. I get angry. I get regrets. What rescued me so many times is, look, isn't God the one in control of your life? Isn't he the one that gave you your family? Isn't he the one that gave you your church? Isn't he the one that gave you your life, gave you these people? When I think about that, and I realize that he's in control and not me, it helps me a lot to let the anger go. Because I cannot get angry when I realize this is all a part of God's plan. And if I got angry, I would probably ruin a divine plan, what he's trying to fashion and make me to be, what he had intended in mind. And you know what he had in mind was a church of, filled with age gaps, cultural gaps, people who wouldn't know each other from Adam, and we have become a mighty testimony to this world that it doesn't matter what nationality, age, or person, or gender, or where you come from, that there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ, that there is genuine Christian love for here, and there is the Holy Spirit in our midst. We prove that in our blowout meetings. We prove that with just a normal Sunday when people come in. What a mighty testimony. But you weren't there when we started in our beginnings. It was always broken and hard. But look what God had in mind at the end. This was the same thing with my family, my marriage, the people I encountered, my friendships, and yes, especially my church. I didn't, I, the worst mistake I could have done was lose my temper, get angry, and then ruin a part of God's divine plan and process. He would not have given me this church. He would not have given me my life that I have today. It's so important to realize God is in control. So why should you be angry? When I felt hurt, so much hurt deep down inside, I had to think about, son, child, why are you angry? Isn't God in control? Every head bow and every eye shut. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open.